Ja. I say good evening, body of Christ. Today we are reading from Acts 2, from verse 14. That is how far we got two weeks ago. And in between we have a Bible quiz in this church. Yeah, everyone got their presents, yeah. <laughs> okay. I say, let us pray. Father, we thank you for the change of seasons, Lord. We thank you that it is a sign of your faithfulness. From the beginning, Lord, you said there will be seasons. And if we look outside and we see this time of year where we're going into autumn or winter, we know that you are faithful to your word always. Thank you, Lord, that we do not have to wonder what your plans for us will be because your plans will be good and faithful and true and just. Thank you, Father, for fellowship with our fellow believers, that the body of Christ can come together, can hold hands, can pray to you, can lift each other up, can equip each other. Thank you, Father. Lead us in your word tonight. Give me an instructor tongue, Lord, so the word that you break open for us tonight will be true will be exactly what you want. Thank you, Holy Spirit. In the name of Jesus, amen. 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 So last time we ended things at the birth of the church, Pentecost. <coughs> right. So the Holy Spirit came as Jesus promised, the helper, the parakletos will come, the one called alongside to help will come. And all 120 in the upper room were filled with the Holy Spirit and they spoke in tongues. And how beautiful was this, that the Lord chose Pentecost to pour out his Spirit. Because usually if you, if you hear about miss, missions or evangelists, they have to go out to the masses. But in this specific situation, the Lord brought all the Jewish people to Jerusalem, waiting for the outpouring of the Holy Spirit so they could witness. They say that there was a mighty sound like a mighty wind from heaven. They didn't feel it, but they heard it. And tongues like fire, like fire, not fiery tongues, tongues like fire came upon their heads, all 120 of them, and they spoke in tongues, and the people listened. And they said, are these men from Galilee? How is it that they're speaking all these different languages and dialects? So we can understand them. Speaking about the wonders of the Lord. And of course, there were some that said, oh, they're drunk. But we had a conversation about it last time. Drunk people do not praise God. They praise themselves. It's all about them. Yeah, I can't stand it when, when, when they do try to <laughs> Actually, yeah. well okay verse 14 <clears throat> then Peter stood up with the eleven raised his voice and addressed the crowd fellow Jews and all of you who live in Jerusalem let me explain this to you listen carefully to what I say these men are not drunk, as you suppose. It's only nine in the morning. No, this is what was spoken by the prophet Joel. Now, who's speaking? 
Peter, the same Peter who denied Jesus three times. Fisherman Peter. The same Peter that did some interesting things throughout the Gospels, pulled out a sword, chopped off the, the priest's um, servant's ear. The one that wanted to build houses for Elijah and Moses. On the, that same Peter just became a pastor. This is his first sermon. Actually, it's the churches, the new found church, first sermon, and Peter is delivering it. He says, these people are not drunk. It's nine in the morning. It's the third hour, which means nine in the morning. The bar isn't open yet. <laughs> They're all coming together to pray, and this happened. They, they are not, I don't know why. Why is this picture of nighttime, Pentecost and nighttime? I don't know. Who sees that too when you read this? Like it's supposed to be night. I wonder where it happened that we've got this mental image that it was during the night. Um, probably in some of the children's Bibles we grew up in, somewhere along there, because I was wondering why does my mind keep going to nighttime when it was actually in the morning? Interesting. Somewhere someone planted a seed, and that is, they, remember the, the importance of planting seeds, because somewhere someone planted a wrong seed and it stuck. And now we have to rewire everything according to scripture. So Peter says it's the third hour and he is going to defend his faith. Who here had to defend their faith before? Most of us. I love how Peter defends his faith because this is exactly how we are supposed to defend our faith. With scripture. When did Peter become a theologian? When did he? I guess Jesus just poured it out into them. Just as you, every time you study the word, the Holy Spirit will protect the word in you and will recall the word for you when you need it. It will be there. So Peter is quoting Joel. Why? Because the New Testament wasn't there yet. <laughs> He's going to the prophets. And he quotes Joel, verse 17. He says, In the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions. And your old men will dream dreams. Why does Peter call this the last days? Why does he reference Joel in the last days? Because remember, we, we keep speaking about this is the last days. We know, we can see. But Peter calls it back then the last days. In scripture, they speak about the last hour. When did this last day begin then? It began the day Jesus was born. That's when the last days began. It just so happens to last more than 2,000 years now. But it's still the last days. We're still living in it. Since Jesus came, till the day he comes back to get us, these are the last days. We are the bride waiting for our bridegroom. He will return. When? Mm -hmm. In the last days. When's that? Don't know. Could be tonight, could be tomorrow, could be the next generation. We don't know. They were already calling that the last days. It could be just about anywhere. 
<coughs> verse 18. Ah, let's read it again. 17. In the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and your daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions. Your old men will dream dreams. Even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days and they will prophesy. I will show wonders in the heaven above and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and billows of smoke, and the sun will turn to darkness and the moon to blood before the coming of the great and glorious day of the Lord. And everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Stop. <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> I know, that's why we're stopping. Mm -hmm. mm. So, who was the spirit poured into? Both? Yeah. Men and women. <gasps> no, can't be. Only men. No. Men and women. The prophet Joel already predicted it in the Old Testament that men and women will dream dreams. They will prophesy. All of them. All of them, men and women. God is not a respecter of persons. Just because women was kind of pushed down all of this time, it does not mean that they, I'm, I'm thinking about one specific woman, Catherine Kuhlman. I mean, she started some, she, she opened the door for women preachers. In the great revival back then, where it, it was unheard of, of women to move in such power. She moved in the Holy Spirit with such power. And men and women would listen to her. And many got saved because of her. And she was just, just this wonderful personality, always smiling. She was just flowing with love. It was a beautiful woman. These long dresses back then and poofy dresses. And She'll probably find it strange today, women wearing pants and stuff like that. But she was a great, she was a great preacher. There's absolutely no reason to keep the daughters of the Lord quiet. None. Does that mean we'll walk right over our husbands? No, we won't. Why? Because we fear the Lord. True daughters of the Lord fear the Lord. They will submit to their husbands, no matter what. They will stay submitted as to Christ. But there's no reason that they cannot preach. There's no reason that they cannot prophesy. There's no reason that they cannot speak in tongues. Remember that on the day of Pentecost, the 120, there was women there too. Jesus' mother was there too. If they say that all of them spoke in tongues, that means the women too. A couple of old guys. Up. Looks like they're having a heart attack at home. How dare I? But that is what it was. The Holy Spirit came down on everyone and still does. We still does. Praise the Lord for that. Now, that interesting little verse 21, you will hear a lot, children of God. You will hear this a lot. People use this, especially against churches like ours. I'll show you a bit later why it's ridiculous. Listen carefully, and everyone who calls on the name of the Lord, will be saved. Amen. What are you listening to? Are they saved? 
So everyone, let, let's change it. Let, let's see what people say. They say this, and everyone who calls on the name of the Lord is saved. That's what they're saying. But if you look carefully, you can make a little circle. I did. My little circle. Will be saved. How? Let's go all the way. Just turn around to verse 37. Yeah. It's not far off. Just, just, I don't know if you even have to turn your page. I do. I do. <sighs> 38, I'm sorry. Peter replied, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Ah, same chapter. Okay, it's not even, it's just, just a couple of verses on. You can't just use one little and say, oh yeah, okay, of course, course let's have a look at it. Actually, I had a long conversation with the Holy Spirit about this, and Marius and I had a long conversation about this one. <coughs> you see, they say, call on the name of the Lord and you will be saved. Okay, let, let's have a look at that. We live in South Africa. I'm sure you are not, uh, what do you call it when you're just in home and you're scared to go outside? Agoraphobic. agoraphobic. Because you're here, so you're not agoraphobic. Okay. So you do go outside. Do you know and have you heard who calls on the name of the Lord? And how is it done? The name of the Lord in our country is a swear word. They use the name of Jesus, changes it a little bit in pronunciation, stole the same word, stole the same holy name you and me bow to, and they use it in vain every sentence, every second word is the name of the Lord. Okay, so... Let's have a look again. So, uh, whoever and anyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. You sure? Are you sure? You see, because they call on the name of the Lord, every second word they say. Is it in reference and awe and wonder of the mighty name of Jesus Christ? No. It's a swear word. When you ask them, anyone, ask them, do yourself a favor because I've asked. Why do you use my Lord's name like that? And they say, oh, well, we're just used to it. Our parents spoke like that. Those before them spoke like that. We are used to wearing it as, using it as a swear word. That name is a holy name to us. Demons <sighs> shake in their pants. I don't have pants. But shake before that name. The name of Jesus. The mighty holy name of Jesus. We use it in a reference and all. We worship him. We praise him with that name. And they use it as a swear word. So are you sure that everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved? You say, yeah, but that's not, that's not fair. Because call on, call on. <laughs> on. Isn't that what they're doing? More than you and me? Because we reserve the mighty name of Jesus for our quiet time to speak to him, to build a relationship with him. We use his mighty name in power but never blasphemous. And we had this talk about whoever and anyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. And now, now you have to know who Jesus is. How do we know? We know because he gave us a textbook about him. 
we know him. We had this conversation and, and I'm not quite happy with the answers yet. The Lord has not given me the answer yet. And I, I would, if you would like to pray on this, please pray with me on this. Because I ask the Lord about the hope we have. You see, we have this hope. The one that gave us the hope was the second thief on the cross. He gave us that hope. As he was hanging on the cross next to Jesus, the other one was blaspheming. The other one was calling him names or swearing at him. But the other one, the second one, he said, Lord, please remember me. And Jesus said, I tell you this today, you will be in paradise with me. <clears throat> but there was something that happened. It was more than that, wasn't there? And as I was sitting with the Lord this afternoon, and I said, Lord, okay. So this man, confess your name. And the Holy Spirit said, but what else did he say? Say, oh. He said, he quiet the other guy down, and he said, we deserve to be here. So what did he do? He repented. He was sorrowful. He knew he belonged on the cross. He knew that his transgressions were so, so many, so much, whatever he did, he belonged on the cross. And the next thing he did is he honored Jesus. And he said, he doesn't belong here. That means right there, he confessed that Jesus Christ has no sin. He is sovereign, he is holy. So he came to the, 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 the name of the Lord. He, he, he said, okay. He doesn't belong here. Maybe he saw him. Maybe he heard of him. I don't know what, what the situation was. But he knew Jesus didn't belong on the cross. But he did. And Jesus said, okay, today you will be with me. What the relationship prior to that was, we don't know. Have they met before? I don't know. So we have this hope, right? All Christians has this hope that if someone is on his deathbed, there's no more time to sin. And call earnestly on the name of Jesus Christ. That the Lord will be good and merciful and save them and take them into paradise. We do have that hope. That's the special hope. And the question I ask the Lord, I'm still waiting for an answer and I will keep praying on it. Well, maybe he just wants us to live with the hope. Is the Lord, but they know nothing about you. And did you not also say, remember the Lord is the Lord of the, the word, the word, the word. Jesus said, verily, verily, I say unto you, to Nicodemus, if you are not born of water and spirit, you will not see the kingdom of God. Is that what Jesus said? Okay. Jesus also said, and they will come to him and they will say, we cast out demons in your name and we did all these wonders in your name. And Jesus said, go away from me, you workers of iniquity, no, unrighteousness. Could be either of those. Go away from me. I never knew you. So now I have questions. And it's okay to have questions. And I'm going to sit with the Lord. And the fact is he does not have to answer me. He does not. Because I still have that hope. Like a little child. Hope that every single one that passes through this life in that last minute, in that last second, would just say, Jesus, forgive me. And he will have mercy on them. That is our hope. 
if you do have the chance. But do not take chances. Because no one knows if you will ever have a chance. No one knows. The Lord wrote the beginning of your life and he will write the end of it. The end is written. Only he knows the end. Will it be quick? Will it not be quick? Will you have time to repent? Won't you? But I'm not going to take chances in this life. I'm going to do what he says. Whenever he says it. If he says, verily, verily, I say unto you, if you are not born of water and spirit, I said, okay, let's go to the baptism. Let's do that. I'm not going to take chances. If you want to play with, maybe I'll go to heaven. Maybe I'll say, sorry, just before I die. You don't know. You don't know. We know directly what Jesus said and what the word says will not go to heaven. There's a whole bunch. I'm not going to go into that because it is in the sermon for, for Saturday. There's a whole bunch of stuff that they said will never see heaven. But if you did not know what that stuff was, what then? Because if you know him, you will study his word. That's a question I have. You can pray with me about it and tell me what the Lord says to you. And we can, as long as it's scriptural, we can, we can speak about it. If it's not, yeah, don't tell me. <laughs> okay. But Joel said, in the name of the Lord, anyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. <clears throat> then Peter does an interesting first he brought scripture in he defended his faith with scripture next he's going to give them proof he's going to give them proof why they're not drunk and the Holy Spirit just came upon them <clears throat> verse 22 men of Israel Listen to this. Jesus of Nazareth was a man accredited by God to you by miracles, wonders, and signs, which God did among you through him, as you yourself know. So what is he using as proof? He's using proof, the miracles that Jesus did. So many of them, the word says that everything was not written here. He brings them proof. Surely, I mean, there was no WhatsApp or Facebook back then. Surely, they spoke to each other. And, and I mean, Jesus was not a boring man. He was an interesting man. Surely, there was talk and rumors and things among them that they spoke about him. Surely these people that they are speaking to now knew Jesus, saw Jesus somewhere, or have heard of Jesus somewhere. Uh -huh. So he uses the first proof, miracles. Verse 23. This man was handed over to you by God's set purpose and full knowledge. And you, with the help of wicked men, put him to death by nailing him to the cross. But God raised him from the dead, freeing him from the agony of death because it was impossible for death to keep its hold on him. Wow. Let's stop there. Second proof. Resurrection. What does Peter do? He says, Oh, you think you murdered him. That's what you think. But he says clearly here, by God's set purpose and foreknowledge. So what is he doing? He's saying, oh, the Lord knew your cruelty. 
He knew what you are capable of doing in any way. So he handed Jesus to you. Because he knew it was his plan to use your cruelty to kill him. So Peter is not giving them any credit. He's actually taking it away from them. I usually tell you, if you want to defeat the enemy, take his honor away and give it to the Lord. If the enemy sends six taxis to drive in front of you this week, bless the Lord. Bless the Lord. Take the power from him. Give it to the Lord. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. Bless them, Father. Thank you, Father. Bless them, Father. Take the honor from the enemy. And that's exactly what Peter is doing. He's taking the honor from them. Oh, you think you kill them. You think you're so powerful. You think if all the masses cry out together, crucify, crucify, you murdered him? No, you did not. God handed him to you because he knew your cruelty. He knew what you were going to do. With someone sovereign, with someone pure and holy like Jesus in you. I think the human condition is an interesting one because they, it's interesting how it's still the same. Nothing has changed. You know, they say the Bible is so old. Why do you read such an old book? People are still cruel, aren't they? They're still cruel. People still worry about themselves more than they do others. People can still be swept up in masses to yell crucify, crucify. All these things can still happen. The Pharisees still think they're better than the rest. So there's no Pharisees anymore. Yes, there are. <laughs> Plenty of them. Plenty of them. You will be surprised what our Lord sometimes say <laughs> during quiet times. If I ask him about something, someone, he will give me an answer. And it's a straightforward, truthful one. Because he is truth. So, can you believe our king, it was impossible for death to keep its hold on him? <laughs> they could brag about their kings. So, our kings, I think about the Romans, I think about Caesar. How many nations has he destroyed and, and pulled into the Roman Empire? That was some king. But, but, <laughs> but, Jesus, death could not even hold him. I'm sure Caesar died. Mm -hmm. Yes, he did. But our king, we can boast in our king. As Paul says, do not boast about yourself. Boast about the king of kings. Boast about your king that conquered death. No other king ever can say that. Only the king of kings. And that's our king. We're privileged. We're so blessed. We're not even, we don't even have to be afraid of death because he conquered it anyway. As death could not keep hold of him, he did all of that so death cannot keep hold of us. Isn't that beautiful? I just love him. Then verse 25, because you see Peter is not done quoting scripture yet. I'm quite surprised with Peter. Mm -hmm. He said, David said, verse 25, David said, I saw the Lord always before me. Because he is at my right hand, I will not be shaken. Therefore my heart is glad and my tongue rejoices. My body also will live in hope because you will not abandon me to the grave, 
nor will you let your Holy One see decay. You have made known to me the paths of life, and you will fill me with joy in your presence. Just read a bit on 29. Brothers, I can tell you confidently that the patriarch David died and was buried, and his tomb is here to this day. So was David speaking about himself? No. David was prophesying the coming of the Messiah. Now, King David was quite the, the man amongst the Jewish people. They honored his grave. They had a special day for David's grave. They, they, oh, they, they went big on, on, on David's um, whole legacy because they knew also that the Messiah would come out of the lineage of David. They knew. But why then does he call them to say, I saw the Lord. Yeah. Hold on. I saw the Lord always before me and, yeah, <laughs> I'll get there. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. David did see the Kai. He died. He's in his grave. He saw the Kai. He was not talking about himself. David called him Lord. How can the Messiah be David's son? That is what Peter is bringing to them. They're waiting for the Messiah, right? They're waiting. They have a bit of a wrong idea because they think the Messiah will come in. There will be a war. Um, the Roman Empire will be thrown out and the Messiah will sit on the throne in Jerusalem on Mount Zion. And Jesus was just not the picture they expected. And Peter's telling them, he's giving them secret knowledge and information about a psalm of David, Psalm 110 verse 1. And do, did you know that Jesus quoted the same psalm in Matthew 22? Go look at it. I, I think we worked through that. We did. Peter said verse 30, but he was a prophet and knew that God had promised him on oath that he would place one of his descendants on the throne. Now let's have a look at that. Okay. Yes, God did tell David that David's bloodline will always be on the throne. Does Israel have a king? No. No. So there had to be a king forever. Bloodline of David. I see how you're frowning. I'll explain it to you now. And I know why you're frowning. <laughs> the bloodline of David. God promised the Messiah through David's line. Did you know Mary and Joseph was from the line of David? Now you can stop frowning. Because we all know that Joseph was not Jesus' real father. We all know that the Holy Spirit came upon Mary and she fell pregnant with Jesus. It was a miraculous conception. Joseph had nothing to do with it. Actually, Joseph wanted to run away because he thought this woman... We're doing naughty things. Until the angel came to him and said, no, this is the son of God. His name will be Jesus. So, yeah, it's still the lineage of David. Okay, it's not, a, not even a question. 
And as Joseph and Mary, yeah, I know they married their cousins and stuff. Yeah, that's what they did. Sarah and, and Abraham was brother and sister. Mm -hmm. Go look it up. So he's telling them all the truth. What is the truth for the Jewish people? The Messiah has come. You were waiting for him, but what did you do to him? You handed him over to evil people and they crucified him. He came out of the line of David. None of you would see. You saw all these miraculous signs. The scripture, he quotes scripture and saying, this is the man. This is who the, the whole Old Testament was the genealogy of Jesus. And this is who you crucified, people. This is who you crucified. Hmm. I'm sorry, I can, I'm a picture person. I see the, I see Peter. Because he was a passionate man. One thing we can say about Peter, he was a really passionate man. 31. Seeing what was ahead, he spoke of the resurrection of the Christ, that he was not abandoned to the grave, nor did his body see decay. God has raised this Jesus to life, and we are all witnesses of the fact. Exalted to the right hand of God, he has received from the Father the promised Holy Spirit and has poured out what you now see and hear. Yeah, I didn't read that right, did I? Exalted to the right hand of God, he has received from the Father the promised Holy Spirit and has poured out what you now see and hear. So this is not supposed to be a surprise to them. The Holy Spirit was poured out, and I think some extra boldness. You have to, you have to see the boldness in Peter here. Yeah. From the man that, uh, that said, I don't know this man, three times, denied Jesus, to this bold preacher standing up amongst all these people in Pentecost saying, Mm -hmm. <coughs> Excuse me. Listen well. And they're listening. They are listening. We'll see that they're listening now. For David, verse 34. For David did not ascend to heaven, and yet he said, The Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. Therefore, let all Israel be assured of this. God has made this Jesus, who you crucified, both Lord and Christ. Let's stop there for a second. So who was David talking about? He could have said, mm, he could have said, Yahweh said to the Messiah, the Lord said to my Lord. I got that other two confused, those two scriptures confused. <laughs> That's why I confused myself. Just no, no. <clears throat> the Lord said to my Lord, This should not be confusing to the, the apostles. But do you see the prophet in David? David did, David did not just sing nice psalms and made war and, and hid in caves almost half of his life. He, David was prophesying. If you remember how the kings in the Old Testament were anointed, what would happen? Samuel both anointed Saul and David. And as he anointed Saul, as the oil dripped from his beard, they said, 
He prophesied. He went out and he prophesied. The Holy Spirit came upon them. The kings had the Holy Spirit in their ear. So the Psalms David has written, all the Psalms, well, most of the Psalms, I didn't write all of them, were Holy Spirit inspired, already speaking about Jesus. Do we still do that, the children of God? Yes, we do. Do you think David saw the full picture when he wrote the Psalms? No, he couldn't even have guessed how mighty the Lord would be, how, well, how beautiful the name of Jesus will be to this day. I don't think so. That was just the words that flowed out of him, that the Holy Spirit made flow out of him. And when you speak in your tongue, in your quiet room, you may be speaking about future things, great big things. Because his daughters and his sons, the men and the women, will prophesy. That means speaking about future things. So we're all probably speaking about future things we do not even know about as the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is just so beautiful. He's got such a way of moving that there's, there's two friends of mine that we tend to sync up every week. We, we're not in the same church. We do not study together. <laughs> we do not discuss our the sermons or the word we're taking out this week. And um, usually when I speak to Emma, she would say, oh, that is what I was speaking about. And she listened to, I think, two weeks back to our um, uh, uh, YouTube video. And she said, I was speaking on exactly the same thing. Because the Holy Spirit kind of syncs us up, especially, you know, if, if, if I have a question, I'll just say, you know, I've, I've been thinking about this. And she'll say, oh, yeah, I'll pray with you on that because I was thinking about it too. Or one of us already has an answer for whatever the other one's question was. Because it's one Spirit. He is the same. He's not a respecter of persons. He is in each of us. And if we listen and we lend him an ear, because some people just do not, you will hear what he's saying clearly. But Marco had a dream the other night, and the Lord gave, started to, you know, give the interpretation. But he gave me the interpretation before he gave it to him. But it was still coming down to the same thing. That is how beautiful the Lord is. That is how mighty. There's nothing he doesn't know. Absolutely nothing. Check the time. <coughs> so David said, the Lord said to my Lord, said, Jesus' enemies will be at his feet soon. Because we're in the last hour. Just as Peter said more than 2,000 years ago. <laughs> we're still in the last hour. He made him both Lord and Christ. When the people heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the other apostles, Brother, what shall we do? Were they listening to Peter? Yes, they were. And they were cut to the heart. What does that mean to be cut to the heart? There comes a time in every believer's life and I'm not talking about um, yeah, maybe I am. I don't know if they also do, but 
we know a lot of pastors that grew up in church. Most of us did not have the privilege. I think no one here had that privilege of growing up with Jesus as we do now. No, we didn't. Our churches was quite dead. Um, there was no manifestation of the Holy Spirit. There was, it was just something you were supposed to do once a week. Go there, sleep if you want, just don't snore. Do this boring little song. No dancing, please. No, no, not, not a song and dance. No, no, just a song. Not even clapping hands. Not even clapping hands, not raising your hands. Nope, you have to stand like this. Got it now. <laughs> and then you speak about that one's shoes and that one's hat and that one's... And the one old lady tries to sing worse than the other one. This one is too fast and that one's too slow and you're just bored. That's the truth. It doesn't help to lie. The Lord knows my heart. Oh, I just love church as a little girl. No, I did not. Okay. Really boring. I never was cut to the heart. The word never cut me. The word is supposed to cut me. I'm supposed to listen to the word and think, oh my goodness, I'm so wrong. I'm, I'm, oh, the, Lord, I'm so sorry. I'm cut to the heart. I can't believe I've been doing this. And your word clearly says I'm not allowed to do this. Father, I'm so sorry. And you go into a cutting of the heart. The, and the, it's so beautiful because the Lord says he's near the brokenhearted. And it's when you break your own heart. When you see the life of Jesus, you know how you were supposed to live, but you did something else anyway. And now it's all a mess, and you have to come to repentance, and we, I think I spoke to Harry about it this week, about really being desperate for Jesus. About being broken down, desperate, down and out, nothing left to give. A desperation. That is a cutting of the heart. Brothers, what shall we do? I went through this cutting during Easter. I went through that. I saw what Easter really was, what the timing really was, why everyone was celebrating it, not even on the right date. If you haven't seen it, go check out uh, Adjusting to the Truth Easter. And that was a cutting. There was a cutting in me. And the first thing I said is, oh, Father, what must I do? What have I done? What have I done? I follow traditions. I follow traditions that I did not follow your word. Father, what must I do? And he said, repent. Repent. I see the sorrow in your heart. Remember the guy on the cross too? He had sorrow in his heart. He knew he was sinful. He knew he belonged on the cross. And the Lord said, my child, just repent and repent to your church now. Go ask them for forgiveness. Because you have been leading them in tradition and not in truth. And he is so, so graceful and merciful that he allowed us to correct ourselves. Was he not? Unless we continue like the Nicolaitans and he says, I hate your deeds at the end of this life. I don't think so. I will adjust. I will adjust by the word just as they are right now. So they ask, brothers, what shall we do? And here's Peter's moment. Mm. Peter has a moment. He says, repent, verse 38, and be baptized. Every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness 
of your sins and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And the promise is for you and your children and for all who are far off, for all whom the Lord our God will call. How perfect is that? So what has to happen first? They believed. The gospel was brought to them. Jesus born. Jesus lived the miraculous signs and wonders. Jesus crucified. Jesus resurrected. Jesus glorified to the right hand of God. The gospel. The gospel were given. They now know who Jesus is. They know, they have knowledge, they understand. They cut to the heart because it was their sins that crucified him. Just, yeah, I know, like today. Our sins were upon him on that day, each one of us. And they <laughs> repented and were baptized. They needed to get baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of sins. Once again, will you take a chance, child of God? Will you take a chance without this? No. No, thank you. And they receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Do you see gift? It's so beautiful because, you know, some people take that and you misuse it. They believe that they have received the gift of the Holy Spirit in any way. Jesus died for me anyway, so I can do whatever I want. And then after this life, I'm just automatically going to heaven. No, you are not. No. It's not how it works. You cannot... Jesus said, follow me, pick up your cross. What does that mean? It's something heavy you have to pick up to follow the shepherd. Follow me, do as I do, go do as I do, continue to do as I did until I come back for you. Keep oil in your lamps, worship me. Fellowship together, be together, stand with each other, pray for each other, keep praying. Not do whatever you like and then you're still going to heaven. The gift was given at the first step of obedience, the baptism. It's good to believe you will be saved if you believe. But then you will get baptized. Mark 16, verse 16. And those who believe and are baptized, those are saved. People are walking around thinking they're saved when they are not. And if you try to speak to them about it, they get aggressive. They get aggressive. They don't want you poking your doctrine into their generational curses and their traditions. It's a problem. I fear for this country. When I hear their definition of Christian, I fear for them. I cry for them. The Lord cries for them. Okay, let's finish this. And it's for who? And now it was only for those people. No, it was for their children and the children after them and every generation after that. 40. With many other words he warned them and he pleaded with them. Save yourselves from this corrupt generation or this perverse 
generation. Those who accepted his message were baptized and about 3,000 were added to their number that day. How beautiful is that? Even if they were 120, that was quite a job. <laughs> Baptizing 3,000. Think about it. There's nothing as beautiful as a rebirth. The rebirth experience. I will gladly baptize. If you tell me there's three thousand people outside that needs to get baptized now, I know this whole church will have themselves in the water waiting for them. And we will not stop until it's done. Because there's nothing like receiving the Holy Spirit and turning your sins over to Jesus and just be free. That feeling, oh my goodness. Mm. Jesus just lift all your sins off of you and give you his spirit. It is a beautiful exchange. Let's end there tonight. So the Lord has set the stage for them to baptize 3,000 in one night to add to their numbers from 120 to 3,120. That sounds better. And the beauty of it is the way the Lord set this up from the beginning is all these people are going to go back home and take the message with them. Thank the Lord for that. Or you and me, down here in South Africa, <laughs> we would not have gotten the message. So thank the Lord that people are still carrying the gospel. Sod your feet with the gospel of peace. Still going out telling people about Jesus. Amen. Let us pray. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father, for every soul you are going to add to us. Thank you, Father, that the disciples in this room, we have a hunger and a thirst for soul winning. Lord, you gave us the Great Commission. You said, go therefore into all the earth. Baptizing, making disciples, baptizing them in the name of the Father, in the name of Jesus Christ, in the name of the Holy Spirit, and teach them. Father, we are passionate about your commission. We are passionate about you first, Jesus. What you've done for us, we can never pay you back. But we can bring others to your feet. And that is what we will do, Lord, not for the rewards on earth or the rewards in heaven. But because we love you. And we want, to, we want everyone to understand and to know the love we have for you. Thank you, Father, for deepening our relationship with you day by day. Thank you, Father, for the hope we have that when we get to heaven, you will wait for us and say, well done, good and faithful servant. Father, that let us live to hear those words. Thank you, Father. In the mighty name of Jesus, amen. Amen. amen.